I'm the founder of the Institute on Holistic Wealth. So I've been training an army of certified holistic wealth consultants based on my book. And so after I published the first edition of Holistic Wealth, so many women came forward and they were like, we want to be certified. We want to be certified in your methods and we want to go out in our communities. We want to help women. We want to help teens and kids. And I developed uh, the certification program during the first half of COVID. And that's the program, the signature program for the Institute on Holistic Wealth now. And, and that's what we're, we're, we're doing. And there's some other courses there, of course, but my work with the Institute on Holistic Wealth is really my mission now. And it's where I spend most of my time training those consultants and doing <laughs> coaching with them and, you know, uh, helping them work with their clients and tailoring, you know, everything that we have to their needs. So that's, that's basically what I've been doing. Now, that's really fascinating because I've, expe- I've met quite a few people who started businesses in the pandemic. And, and I'd like to just, if we can, because I know you, you touch on this in your book and, uh, and you feel about this is important, that, that actually adversity can be the catalyst that we need. We don't court adversity, of course, but, but, but adversity and difficulties can be that catalyst that we need to break our old uh, identity or our old limitations or our old thought patterns. Do you want to just um, explain what, how you feel and think about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree, Jason, that or, you know, that adversity can help clarify your life purpose, can help clarify your life mission is we really find out through this, you know, whatever adverse experiences that we have, that really, you know, the purpose of life is to, to, to advance um, humanity and to do something that's bigger and broader than ourselves, right? And so in the book, in Holistic Wealth, I talk about that a lot. After a while, I began to see my adversity as this gift that I was now endowed with. And I'm so grateful for this message because through this gift, and at the time, it was just a, it, it was really a tragic experience I went through when my husband died. But now I'm realizing how I can use my experience, especially as a trained economist, to help other women and to help them get empowered and to help them with their personal finances and with their money and rewriting their money stories. And, and through COVID, it's, it's become even more meaningful, right, as we collectively go through this trauma. And as we think about what we want our post-COVID lives to look like. So um, it's taken on far more meaning and it's, it's, it's come out of my adversity 100% uh, because it made me realize, you know, that my unique story and my unique experiences could help others and could help other women and other men who are facing uh, um, adversities in their own life and how to chart a life forward after that adversity and, and knowing how to navigate that so that they come out you know, better on the other side. Mm -hmm. So definitely I, I agree. And, you know, as, you know, as readers will go through the book, they'll see it. And, and it's something that I've been also preaching (laughs) to my consultants and as well as, you know, as they help other women, right. And other men come out of adversity. And in the book, you, uh, I mean, you do it in a subtle way, but you talk about the hold that money has over people. Um, and how that can lead to um, people doing things that they aren't good for them. So do you want to just um, elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Money does that have, have that hold, especially if we have a, a scarcity mindset. And, you know, in the book, I talk about this scarcity mindset versus the holistic wealth mindset. And it's also something I'm coaching clients on too. And, and with a scarcity mindset, it's unbelievable to hold that money can have on us because let's say, you know, you have individuals who grew up in in poverty or grew up during a war period or grew up with insecurity of some kind and money does have that hold because once you reach to adulthood, you just want to compensate and overcompensate for those things you missed out on. And you think, yeah, I never had this when I was younger. So I deserve this now, especially if I've worked hard and especially if I've tried to give myself a life that I should. But then the scarcity becomes like this cycle, right? Where we're making decisions in this cognitive pattern that's not helpful for us. And, you know, in behavioral economics, you know, we've studied the scarcity mindset a lot and it just has deep, deep roots in our brain and habits and patterns. And then we engage in 
in activities that are not helpful, especially money decisions that are not helpful. And then we go in a cycle where, okay, we think we have to compare ourselves to others. We see another lifestyle on social media and then we spend more because we want to have that perception that yes, I've made it, I'm wealthy. And this is why that whole concept of holistic wealth and the holistic wealth mindset is so important because it's not just necessarily rooted in your net worth. You know, when I often tell people that, you know, if you think your self-worth is tied to your net worth, then that's that's actually a money block right there. Um, so we have to get past that because it's not, you know, our net worth isn't our self-worth. Um, and so that's that whole that whole theme in the book that comes out where, you know, money has that hold and money is one of the greatest trauma bonds. And it, it really does act as that trauma bond that can go through with us for a lifetime if we don't release that trauma bond, if we don't, you know, tell ourselves, listen, I'm releasing the past, you know, whatever happened to me in the past is the past. And there's this whole new life and new money story and new relationship with money. And I'm coming from a place not of lack, I'm coming at this from a place of wholesomeness and a place of self-worth and self-love. So I don't need that money to validate me in those ways because I'm now rewriting a whole personal money story, not around, you know, the lack and the scarcity that once was, but of this wholesomeness, this fulfilling life, this more meaningful, purposeful life that I have. So I think, you know, and especially in this new edition of the book, readers will be able to see that coming out more. And it's something I'm training. I'm actually developing a certification program called the Trauma of Money Certification that's being released on February 26th. And we talk about a lot of that material there too. You know, how those trauma bonds with money can follow us throughout life. And if we let it happen, you know, what, what are the implications of that? So I think that's a great question, Jason. And um, it's something that people should definitely be aware of. Now, following on from that, Keisha, I think it's really relevant. As we come out of COVID, and I appreciate in every different country around the world, it's different. In the UK here, we are now, we have today, all of our restrictions are dropped, everything, okay? So we have no restrictions. We can do whatever we want, wherever we want, obviously be sensible. You know, don't bear hug people right. if you've got a big cold going on and uh, or you've got symptoms. But the point is, we, we pretty much are back to normal, whatever that is. Now, the question I have for you is, bear in mind all of what you know, your certification and the traumas you've already gone through and the, your own learning. There is a possibility that many people will think, oh, I've come out of this big sort of thing. I need that holiday to the Seychelles. Oh, I need the bigger house. Oh, I'm going to get myself a new car. Oh, I'm going to buy the new clothes. In other words, they've been whether whether through choice or through um uh through restrictions they've not had the same chance to spend the danger now is that they have a lot more opportunities sp to spend but also they're telling themselves that they deserve it so i'm just wondering what strategies or tactics people could uh use to to i, I don't again i'm not saying people must never spend money on nice things but for, they, for them to be much more conscious and aware of the spending and the implications it has on their overall financial and mental health. Absolutely. And, you know, Jason, we've had several waves of cycles before where restrictions have been lifted and we feel like we're there, we're out of this and boom, another um, variant strikes. We had that with Delta and then with Omicron. And people have been through different cycles of revenge spending. Right. And it's the, the <laughs> revenge that, spending. yeah, as you is that what you call revenge, it? revenge spending? That's the name. Revenge, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's this feeling that you know what? I've been locked up and cooped up at home with, with all these restrictions for all this time. And I'm going to go out there and, and really just spend. And I'm going to live that <laughs> life because I've been cooped up and I want to go out with my friends now. And I want to buy these nice clothes to go out, and I'm going to buy, you know, uh these nice meals at nice restaurants and we saw with the wave we saw with the delta wave that once restrictions were lifted people went out on revenge spending and i think it's going to be a cycle again as restrictions lift this time around because we're facing that too where we're hearing in canada that you know our restrictions will be lifted kind of towards the end of february so pretty soon and people will be thinking yeah I'm going to go revenge spend again. And so we don't want to get ourselves into this cycle of revenge spending because as an economist, I've seen and I've studied these patterns, 
you know, who knows? We might be going into a war. I mean, Europe might be headed there, right? We don't know what will happen. And so I've always encouraged people to be cautious. Just be cautious. We're still kind of in, in a global pandemic. We're still in kind of the uncertainty period. Yes, you know, uh, you know, we have far more in terms of vaccinations available and things available that will allow us to kind of have some more sense of normalcy. But as an economist and one who's seen various, you know, periods of boom and bust, I would encourage people to, you know, stick to your budgets, think about what you want that post-pandemic life to look like. It might not be that you need to spend more to enjoy yourself. It might be that you're able to still have a level of enjoyment and meaning in your relationships, getting together with friends and family without having to go all out and spend, spend, spend. Mm. And, you know, it's funny, Jason, during the first half of lockdown, many women who read Holistic Wealth came back to me and they said, you mentioned something about personal financial identity. How can we know how to identify ours? And I developed this quiz called the Personal Financial Identities Quiz. It's available on the Institute on Holistic Wealth website. And, you know, the purpose of that quiz is to embrace your own personal financial identity. It's very easy now that restrictions are lifting for all of us to follow the crowd and be like, yeah, my friends are asking me, am I going on cruises now? Am I booking spring vacations? Spring break is coming up uh, and people are thinking about that again. And so taking this quiz will allow you to really identify your personal financial identity and know how to harness strength. So like if you're a minimalist, but you have all maximalists around you who are just ready to spend and geared up and ready, then you might need to use your, you know, your personal financial identity to communicate to people that, you know what, I'm more of a minimalist. I think COVID has taught me that, you know, I need to stick to that minimalist lifestyle that makes me comfortable and that makes me feel safe and secure. And the vast majority of people who've taken it during COVID, Jason, have identified as minimalists. I think that's the other thing that COVID has done. It's basically, you know, made a lot of people realize that, you know, this, this basic, this minimalistic lifestyle may be good. It may be good for how we weather these storms. Because, hey, if, if I don't need to spend and I can save then I'm able, you know, to get over this hump. Yeah. I can see myself being more financially resilient. And it, so yeah. that's another big part of the puzzle, I think, with, you know, as we think about restrictions lifting. Well, I've just written a blog uh, this week about um, the fact is, you know, I'm a multimillionaire and I've spent my life, you know, I came from nothing and I've built wealth and I don't have to work at all. And I don't say that's a bag. Um, but today I went into a discount shop and bought two pairs of trousers, just reasonable trousers, not designer or anything, just clean, tidy trousers, which would have cost the equivalent of, you know, uh, I don't know, um, $60. Okay. Now I can afford to buy anything possible. And the point I say for that is that, but I still get a kick out of going to the discount shop, buying these two perfectly good pair of trousers, just for walking around the house and stuff. Nothing wrong with them at all. Very happy with what I've spent. Um, uh, if I'd have spent 300 pounds and bought the latest Gucci, whatever, it wouldn't have made me any happier. I'm very happy I got these pairs of trousers. So the, the, the point is, is that knowing that you can do something um, is, is, is half the battle. Um, and just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so I think it's that mindfulness right. and thinking about it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, other people might look at these trousers and think, God, this guy needs to, you know, get out more and rebuild his life. But I think that's the point you're <laughs> making, isn't it? Um, can I just ask another question if I can, yes. um, before we sort of come to the summary part of your, uh, and just the, 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 the thinking you have, if I can just touch on it, it's such a sensitive subject. You sadly did lose your husband in uh, when you were very uh, not long married. And I'm just interested if you could just share with, I mean, how did you navigate, first of all, losing the love of your life, but not, not just that, but, but how you then had to realize, hang on, it's just me. Uh, you had all these ideas of your life. Uh, and of course, the definition of, of success and the role of, of making money and validation. I'm just wondering, how did you reset that? Because you do touch on this in the book, don't you? Absolutely. And it's such a wonderful question, Jason, for the times we're in, because many people will have to reset during COVID. And so you're right. When my husband died, I was 31, just given birth to my second child just eight weeks prior. Right. And I had a three year old. So you can't imagine this was sudden. He died of a disease that was so rare. 
most doctors will never see it in a living patient in their lifetime. They can only read about it in textbooks. So it took a year for them to even find after the autopsy to find the cause. They had to assemble a team of pathologists across the United States and Canada. And during that time, it was very, very difficult as a new mom to balance everything while I was grieving, figuring out my next steps. And what really helped was taking the time, you know, to really figure out my next steps. And I took a sabbatical, a one year unpaid sabbatical. Luckily, we had put plans in place. We had our investments and everything was in place. So I had the opportunity to do that and to craft a lot life going forward for me and and my two kids. And you're right, it requires a different mindset to come out of something like that. So in the book, you know, I mentioned this victim mindset that 95% of us get stuck in. And I had to realize that that victim mindset would no longer serve me. So yes, it's okay to have those pity parties. And yes, it's okay sometimes to feel like, wow, you know, I've been dealt these cards. This is unbelievable. But the mindset of empowering yourself with a mindset that gets you up, gets you motivated. And I talk about that in the book too, with the motivation from within framework is so important to get us through these times that we're facing these adversities and these tragedies. And the very first thing I had to do was to switch the mindset that I was this victim and that I would feel like this was a permanent setback. And you know how I talk about the holistic wealth mindset in the book? Well, that's part of the holistic world mindset, just not thinking of things in permanent terms, but just temporary, knowing that, you know what, this wouldn't set me back for life. This was temporary, although it felt so huge at the time. I I just really felt like, wow, this is so huge. Now that I look back, I'm realizing that it was a good thing I embraced another mindset because now I can look back and I can smile. And I think I use that time wisely. I use that time while I was on sabbatical to craft this holistic wealth framework to help others with a mindset that can empower other people. And so the mindset is a big part of it. And another thing I, I talk about, Jason, which is important for me, and I'm sure will help so many people listening in is the holistic wealth method that I also outlined in the book. So we make on average more than 30,000 decisions per day. And most of the times we make those decisions mindlessly. It's just like you were saying a while ago with spending on those trousers. And what really got me through it was thinking about, okay, what activities empower me versus activities that deplete me? And if I'm going through my day thinking about the activities that enrich me and doing those activities more, then that's a framework for overcoming trauma as well. That's a framework for working yourself through it each and every single day. And so, you know, we need to think about those additions to our holistic wealth bank account rather than the depletions, right? And then of course I talk about when you you, you deplete yourself so much that you start to feel bankrupt inside. And I know that feeling completely. And so it's good to think about that holistic wealth method that can get you through, through these rough times, do the thing things that enrich you, do the things that calm you, do the things that bring you peace on a deep level and joy and happiness. And it's hard in the beginning, but it gets easier over time to do it. Mm. And it's such a wonderful way to empower yourself each and every single day when you get up and you remember those things. Coupled with that mindset that I talked about earlier, I think that's, um, you know, that's the framework in a, in a basic sense. Yeah. Um, that's the framework that is is so needed. And that's what helped me personally through tragedy. And I think the other thing is to anticipate things are going to, you're going to have problems in the future and you're going to have uh, setbacks and you have obstacles. That's being human. That's not, a, that's not a terrible thing. And that's how whole of humanity has gone on, hasn't it? But I suppose the way to think about it, and I certainly got the f- feeling from reading your book was that that really money is merely a bit like gas in the tank or electricity in your electric vehicle battery it's just a fuel it's just a thing you need it's not the end in itself it's not like you don't say oh i'm going to drive around with a big tank of gas or a fully charged battery do you I mean, you know like having money in your bank it's just right oh i've got some gas and i've got some electric in my battery so it means i've got 300 miles of range but actually where do i want to go and what am I going to do along the way? Am I going right. to stop along the way? I'm going to have listened to a podcast and listen to some music. So I think it's that I think that's what I'm getting from your book is that that purposefulness of of not just the destination, but also the journey that you go through. 
and just see the money as an enabler. Absolutely. And that's exactly what it was for me at the time. It was this enabler that helped me to heal, to give me the space and the time to heal. And it was the other pillars of holistic wealth that came into place where the money was the enabler. The other pillars became like, you know, an energizer that kind of set that healing in motion. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that in the book as well. And those other pillars are so important. Um, you know, your mental, your physical health, all of that. And we're seeing that with COVID, like it's so important. And, and, and that's, everything is interdependent, right? And, and we need to focus on all of these pillars and, and having that balance and harmony in life is, is key to getting through those adversities. Mm. Well, look, Keisha, um, thank you very much for your time. I mean, you, you are a, a ray of sunshine. You've got a lovely warm glow about you as a person. I know that for a fact. It comes out of the pages of your book. And I and obviously we'll put the show notes, uh, a link to your website, a link to that quiz that you uh, mentioned, and also how people can get hold of your book. And I know you're a great public speaker. So hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to get you over in the UK and uh, and, and hear you strut your stuff in, in person because we're just starting to have keynotes now, real in-night person co- uh, talks. And uh, and obviously, Canada is a lovely country as well. So hopefully we'll, we'll cross paths in the future. But look, thank you ever so much for being on the show. It's been lovely to hear from you. And thank you for your time.